and welcome to the studio. You are live at Triple H 100.1 FM. My name is Alexi Boyd, your trusted advisor, admin lover and lover of all things small business as well. I'm very excited to be welcoming some friends of mine from Bamboo Consulting, Ingrid and Jake. Thank you so much for joining us today, guys. Well, thank you Great. for having us. Good now, to be here. Now, today we're going to be talking all about something which I think is pertinent pretty much to every small business owner, in particular in the space around HR. So, you know, HR is difficult. It's one of our major issues. It always comes up in conversation. It comes up in surveys. It comes up in big banks' data when they're talking to small business about their issues. And it's all about how to attract and retain talent to your business. So when you're hiring, especially when it's your first one, small businesses tend to get bogged down in what this person is going to do instead of how I'm going to get the right person and when they start the doing, how can I grow and help them evolve and help them become something more than what I originally thought it was going to be. In particular with the younger generation, and I'm going to say the M word, the millennials, you're ultimately competing with talent with other bigger businesses as well. But that's not a reason to feel like you can't compete or you don't have anything to offer as a small business. So why is it that small business sometimes fail to compete for that talent? Is it because the issue of our portrayal in the media as, you know, the florist or the butcher? Or is it because we're stuck in mentally only offering the candidate the same experience we have and talking as if, you know, you've got to learn from the ground up or you've got to climb the ladder and earn your stripes and all those sort of things because the workforce has, of course, changed. Well, the reality is your potential employees aren't actually seeing the so-called opportunities you're offering. They're actually seeing a job. So we're going to talk to Ingrid and Jake from Bamboo Associates, who between them have corporate, startup, advisory and helping listeners to take the leap of faith to attract and retain the right candidates. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lexi. Jake, tell me a little bit about Bamboo and and what it is that you guys do and why your experiences lent itself to helping businesses with particularly around the employment area. Sure. Um, Bamboo helps ambitious business owners really grow and thrive. Mm. And there are a whole lot of obstacles that they would encounter doing that, from really understanding how they can shop on their competitive edge to what things should they focus on that really matters. Mm -hmm. And one of the common things that we find is how to attract and retain this high caliber team. And it's a pretty difficult thing to do. Um, Many businesses would cite that as their number one impairment to number one obstacle to growth and so we thought um, having a conversation just sharing a few insights of what we've learned in that space uh, some practical things that they can do to overcome those problems would be a a helpful thing for your listeners to hear today. Now you've got a background with SEEK of course which means that you come from a really fantastic point of view almost looking at it from a corporate point of view did you also deal with um, small businesses as well in that role? Yes um, small businesses are critical for SEEK um, there are a fair portion of unique roles on, on Seek um, from small businesses. Um, so not the cut and paste job that we get for, from, from the corporates when they're just looking for a job description that matches the other job description. Exactly. Um, and at Seek, you know, there was lots of research about how to help those small businesses prepare for that candidate, how to think through the issues, how to communicate that in their job ad. And it wasn't just about the ad, but also understanding how to treat that candidate when they came in for an interview and then when they're actually in the role, helping that candidate succeed. And there are unique things that small businesses can do and there's some strengths that they've got that they should be using. And many seem to be in the mindset that they're in some way behind bigger corporates. And that's not really the case. They do have assets, they do have strengths, and they should really play to those and attract the quality candidates that they're after. And we're definitely going to come to that a little bit later in the program where we're going to talk about what what are our strengths? Why is it we shouldn't hide behind the facade of just being small and tiny? We've actually got a lot to offer. Now, um, Ingrid, let's, uh, let's talk about firstly, you know, I guess before you even approach the candidate, what do you need to consider when you're setting yourself up for the mindset of employing someone, particularly that first employee? Because that's a big Mm. hurdle for small Mm. business, isn't Mm. it? Mm. Absolutely. That's a great question. It starts with getting super clear about why your business exists, what the real purpose is behind your business, what the driving force is behind your business. So clearly it's not about just making money. It's got to be something much deeper than that, much higher purpose than that. So, for example, are you a business that, let's say, a jewellery business where your real purpose there is to give your 
customers a moment of joy, a moment of feeling very special? Or are you a tech company that has a great product that could transform someone's work day and give them a, a, a much better work-life balance? So it's really starting with getting super clear on what your real purpose is and the, the driving force behind the business and being able to communicate that. And that's exactly the same thing that's going to attract customers to your business as well as attract talent to your business. Because like you were saying early on, what's really changed um, in the workplace nowadays is people, generally speaking, aren't looking for a job. Certainly not in Australia where most of our basic needs are met. People want something much more much more significant they want a, a reason to get out of bed and being able to be clear on that is what will drive the commitment in the business um, why when things are really tough you'll have people go the extra mile while people will um, think out the box it's what drives innovation so it really starts Alexi with being very very clear around what the life force is behind your business. What is the purpose of that business? I suppose one of the reasons, one of the main things you really highlighted there was that, that building of trust. Mm. And almost as though if you don't have any direction, how can you possibly bring anybody around along for that journey with you? Uh, build the trust and then expect them to, like you said, go that extra mile. And I think... I think it's safe to say without any real data behind us that people are more, um, I guess, loyal to a small business than they would be to a giant Absolutely. corporate. Absolutely, It's like giant corporates have to like do exciting days, corporate days and build yeah. things with spaghetti and string yeah. in order to build, yeah. you know, those, those relationships that we, we have innately Absolutely. as small businesses. And, and a huge advantage that small businesses have over larger corporates is obviously um, – People are working in much smaller teams, and so you have much more direct contact with the founder of the business. So the whole energy of the business is entirely different. And to really capitalize on that, because, you know, let's be frank, to uh, start a small business and certainly to succeed in growing a small business takes an extraordinary kind of vision and vitality and, crazy and stamina <laughs> and a certain kind of madness. <laughs> And, and that's, there's a magic in that, and mm. that is very, very attractive. Um, and that will certainly trump a kind of another day at the office. Mm -hmm. um, and that's pretty hard for a big corporate to compete with. And that's, that's one of those things we're going to focus on today is that what, what really gives us the edge and, and our ability to compete. Would you, would you agree there, Jake? Absolutely. Um, the ability, you know, once you've got this clear uh, purpose that you can articulate in your job ad or actually in the interview is going to attract the right ca caliber candidate, the right kind of candidate. And that will then make sure that you're aligned and that candidate's motivation is going to be aligned with yours. The only way you're going to deliver your customers a great experience if you've, is if you've got a candidate that's aligned with your purpose. Mm. And so you, you really have to practically use that and articulate that very clearly throughout the process mm -hmm. consistently. And, and that also goes to the honesty. Um, if you're a small business, just say it. Don't try and pretend to be a big business and then the candidate's going to mm -hmm. do some research, are going to arrive and realise you're not. Or worse even, actually take the job, start the job and realise it's not what they want and then they leave. And the mm -hmm. pain and distraction for you, your business, your customers and the rest of your team is enormous. So absolutely agree on the the need to have that clear purpose and be super super honest throughout the process do you think there's been a, a power shift in that way you know we always you know five ten years ago we're like oh i'm gonna i'm gonna be checking you out on social media i'm gonna be looking at your facebook profile and all the pictures online of you to make sure you're the right candidate do you think that's flipped and now they're looking at us candidates definitely do the research they do that that do that thoroughly um it's really big in the candidate's life. It's critical. They're going to be spending hours and hours doing it. And for them, they're researching everything, all decisions they make. So they're certainly going to be researching where they work. And young people do that particularly well. So one thing you might do as an employer is research yourself. Find out what prospective candidates are going to be reading about you. How do you counter that? Or how do you put alternative messages out there? Um, how many people see your job bad but don't apply because they read bad things about you? Those bad reviews, for example, which can hurt. I never thought mm. of this. The recruitment mm. process mm. as well. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Why would why would mm. you want to work for a place where your customers don't like the product, don't like the experience? Yeah, that's mm. a very good point. Mm. Uh, let's talk about um, the the fact that you know 
there are more options, I guess, in the corporate world, Jake, because of the, the growth and the evolution of a, a role. Is that something that you need to consider when you're at that point of advertising the role, that there is still growth and an ability to change and evolve and learn other things? Mm. Um, small businesses can't offer the breadth that big corporates do in some ways, but they can offer great breadth in other ways too. And they really need to to think about this and turn this into an advantage. If you're a member of a small team, your understanding of end-to-end of business processes and the customer experience is going to give someone incredible insight uh, into the overall business and the overall decisions that are made in a business that you can never get by being stuck in some silo in some large corporate. Um, and so somebody who thinks holistically, someone who's really wanting to understand, someone who wants to uh, get the customer perspective or whatever their function is within the business, actually have real customer interaction, get diversity with on the role or within the job, all of that can be offered in a small business much greater than a big business could ever offer. And small businesses need to not only articulate that in a positive way, in a practical way for that particular business and that particular role, um, but they also need to go and structure and think about the role somewhat for when the candidate actually starts. So don't just say that in the ad, but explain when the candidate takes the role, what would day-to-day experiences be and articulate that in a way that will be different to the big corporate so that it is attractive to the candidate. Daily or weekly, you will see this, you will hear that, you will learn about these kinds of things. And attracting candidates with that desire for understanding is surely the kind of candidate you want. You don't want someone who's a robot in the role. You want someone who's yearning for a deep understanding of the business and really get that customer perspective. And, and you can offer that and attract the candidates who are looking for that. It's an mm. asset they, mm. should, they should use. Ingrid, would you agree with that? Completely agree with that. And I think that there's, there are other things that a small business can um, leverage as well. When you're small... It's obviously much easier to um, enter into more diverse arrangements and provide other benefits to employees. Things like um, flexible working hours or um, things that that really matter to an individual and that become very difficult for a big corporate um, to actually manage. And I don't think one must underestimate the importance of the culture of an environment as well, that that really matters. So to have a place to go to that you really enjoy going to and that there is a small team with a set of sort of more meaningful relationships um, matters a great deal to, to many people and to be sort of respected as an individual. As um, opposed to just being a, a chunk in a silo. Yeah, mm. yeah. And there are many businesses... I, I've had discussions recently with people working for large businesses who sort of perceive flexibility as well never mind you don't need to come into the office you can just work from home and you know whilst that might be attractive on one level it's extremely lonely on another level Mm -hmm. and actually erodes the the relationships and um, it's very interesting to see the consequences of it where um, it starts to break down communication at some level people start to be quite fearful around have they actually been correctly understood or not because you're actually having fewer and fewer conversations face face to face face. Mm -hmm. and then worst of all people are starting to doubt well what was the real driver behind this? Was this really because you felt that I needed the flexibility? Or in fact, do you just not want to pay for an office space? Yes. And that's something that you can always question in the corporate area. But whereas with small business, it's just, no, that's okay. You need to, you know, in this particular day, look after the kids. And I understand that. So is it more of a results base? Because I was actually speaking to Amy Smith um, (coughs) recently. She's a millennial expert and she talks to corporates about this. Is it about the... Um, I guess the the space that you're in, is it about making things results driven instead of hours driven absolutely. when you're talking to the younger generation? Would you agree with that, Ingrid? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. I think businesses have generally changed from structuring roles around inputs and inputs, you get get this information, you work this amount of time, you even wear certain clothes to being structured around outputs. 
and how to think of that in terms of customer experience or particular outcome uh, deliverable that you need to go and achieve. Mm. Um, and I think for some perhaps older business owners, this can be a bit of a challenge. Maybe it's not the way they, they learned about things. And so for some people, they do need to reframe how they communicate the role and how they communicate success to a candidate in a role. Uh, and that's not always an easy, easy thing to do. When we come back after the break, uh, we're going to stop now for some community service announcements. I want to ask you guys about that advertising point. I mean, really, we are advertising ourselves. How some practical strategies in which we can make ourselves more attractive at that point when they're really that first... Uh, that first um, exposure to us, which is reading the job ad. You're listening to Small Biz Matters with Alexi Boyd. We'll be back after this. So today we have been talking to Ingrid and Jake from Bamboo and Associates, and we're talking about, I guess, um, the importance of uh, understanding the best way to hire in your business. Now, this is this is a problem that all businesses face. I guess maybe Ingrid, is it because everyone's trying to find a mini me? Yes, yes. <laughs> is very it because often. You're, you've got? Because I guess if you're in business for a few years and then you're ready to grow, you're really set in your ways. You've got a certain way mm. of working. Mm. And then you almost have to open yourself up for having someone next to you and having Absolutely. someone, um, I guess, with you on the journey. And that's what yeah. you were saying at the beginning of the program. You have to be able to articulate what it is that you do, why you do it, your vision, because mm. you need to bring someone mm. along with that Absolutely. journey. Absolutely, And the very next step is being clear on what kind of team you need. You cannot build a business on your own. No, There's that's right. There's a big difference between have you created a job for yourself or are you actually in the business of building a business? So you're quite right, Lexi. The first hurdle that you've got to get over is stop looking for mini me's mm, and mm. and break that mentality um, entirely and be and and let go of control um, and empower others and be super super clear around what kind of team you'd need um, and so in building on that what's also really important in terms of attracting that team to you is to be able to sell what kind of opportunity you've spotted and and what the business can offer those individuals um, and within the context of realizing that a lot of people are no longer looking for a job for life mm -hmm. um, that we do work in an environment now where we just need to settle into the fact that you know people might join the team and they'll be there for a couple of years and they'll move on and that's okay so you don't own employees no you don't have them you don't they're not under your wing. All these expressions that we've had for the last few decades about work and jobs. It's, Absolutely. it's not about that anymore. Absolutely. And that we've got to break, let go of mentalities like, oh, well, you should be grateful to have a job. Um, that's, that really impairs the relationship. So when you're talking about advertising or getting yourself out there, we know, we've talked about how money, many strengths small businesses and have, but how do you articulate that? I mean, I think writing a, a job ad is almost like advertising your business. Um, is it that point, Jake, that maybe you should get someone on board to write it for you because it's so difficult to describe your strengths? Getting some help might be a good way, but I'd be, be cautious to get anyone who was a professional writer to come in and actually do that for you. There's a real risk there that it comes across as a corporate ad and you start using jargon. And that's just going to create, uh, missell what the opportunity really is for the candidate. You're not then playing for your strength, to your strength. Mm -hmm. um, it is best for you to just be really honest and really open and communicate the way the job is really going to be. Um, if you can convey what it's going to be like to be part of the team in the job ad, then you're going to attract the right kind of people. What don't, sort of words could you use? Well, I'd rather not have particular words because those words then are going to be quite generic. The point is the words need to be the words that you would use. Mm. Um, that's going to attract the right kind of candidate. Um, don't go and write a job ad that looks like a corporate job ad, but then you're going to attract corporate candidates who are going to arrive at the interview and go, but this is a small business, I don't want it. So have, have it warts and all. Have it, have it real. Um, you have... 
a, a job ad that articulates what the actual role is going to be like. And Show of course, your character. You need to be selling two things. You need to be selling, on one hand, you need to be selling the business, the journey, what, what the vision is, what the strengths are of the business, but also selling the role itself. Now, we haven't, we've talked a lot about the business and, and uh, what you need to be able to see yourself as in order to articulate that and, and where this person fits into the business. Mm-hmm. But that role, fundamentally, if you're trying to attract younger people in particular, they want to see growth. So how do you say initially in that, in that first um, exposure that, that, that the role is going to be able to develop and grow um, while still being able to articulate what that role is? It's hard for small businesses mm-hmm. because we don't, we, don't, we don't even see job ads anymore. You know, we don't even look at job ads. Mm-hmm. We're not part of the mm-hmm. HR department, so we don't know what that, that mm-hmm. wording is. I'm just trying to tease out some wording out of you, Jake. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, I get it. <laughs> um, instead of having particular words, maybe there are a few subjects that you should touch on in the ad. Um, So things like how a candidate would have direct contact with the business owner, um, how they would be part of or witness key decisions being made. Again, in a big corporate, you don't know. Something else is happening on another floor, people you don't even know. Um, You could talk about how you would get a real end-to-end understanding of the whole business, Mm. what's really going on in production or in logistics or sales or service or marketing. And if you're part of a small team, you might wear several hats and you'll really understand that. Mm. Again, that goes to a candidate who genuinely wants to understand a business, wants to understand an industry. And they might even want to do that to open their own business someday. Um, And that might be a bit threatening or a bit frustrating because then, hey, the candidate's not going to stay long. They're going to go and maybe even compete with me. But the kind of candidate who's motivated to start their own business and genuinely wants to understand is the kind of candidate who's motivated. That's the kind of person you want to have on board. So as long as you structure your business and structure the role knowing this is going to be a person who's going to absorb and understand and push and want to learn and then leave, that's okay as long as you're flexible around that. I'd rather get the quality candidate in for a few years than get someone in who doesn't really want to do the job and isn't really motivated. Another thing you could talk about would be the impact or influence that you can have on the organization. If you are a new recruit in an organization of hundreds or thousands of people, what impact are you really going to have? You come and join a small team and you've got an idea, maybe you can pitch your idea to the business owner or to the customer or whatever it might be. Um, The one with that, the challenge is that sometimes people claim that, but then candidates say... I've seen in research where the owner doesn't actually walk the talk. They do have to walk the talk. So don't say, come in and influence me. I'd love to hear your ideas. <laughs> but then say, no, 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 I've done this for 20 years. You've just arrived. I'm not interested. So you do actually genuinely have to be open and real to that. So there might be some sort of self-reflection about how you manage there and then communicate mm. that. that as well. And maybe it's something slightly different from influence. Maybe it's just, like we were saying earlier, it's about being real. So if you're a small business and you're on a growth path, well, then get real about what that looks like, because that's really what the candidate's going to be involved in, is the build of that business. And so getting specific of of actually what is it that you're building. Currently, um, we're working with a client where they've been in business for 16 years. They've only ever had inbound sales. They're operating in a market that's now extremely competitive and they've got to change their game if they're going to survive and if they're going to grow and thrive. And so they've now got to look at how to generate outbound sales. That team's never done that. Um, And that's really, you know, depending on how you play it, incredibly exciting because it's kind of, okay, well, let's, how are we going to do this? We're a small team. We're going to get around the table and we're going to brainstorm it. And we're all going to dig deep and think about what we know. um, And we're going to try stuff and we're going to see what we learn from it. And speaking of being in a team as well, there's no reason why you can't talk to other people in your business if you've Mm. got a new role coming in, asking them what you would like that that person. So they've almost got... They've almost got an HR hat that they get to wear as well. Yeah. Yeah. I would actually just hesitate to add there that um, not all businesses should be employing people. You, you, you need, you <laughs> We've need... got one client just like that. Oh, Very out. competent client, but one of the initial starting things is I do not want to employ anybody. So how do you help me grow without employing a single person? <laughs> Challenge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I would say that not all businesses should 
<clears throat> be in a position to employ people because they don't necessarily have the finances to do so or they have zero understanding of what it means to employ and payroll and super. And also they underestimate. They just go, well, this is what this person's going to cost me hourly. Uh, and so then they forget about the super. They forget about the entitlements. Mm. They forget mm. about the, you know, mm. the, the effect on your business when people are unable to work, even if they are, aren't getting annual yeah. leave and sick leave. And the extra administration that it takes to run payroll yeah. um, and all the all the fun mm-hmm. <laughs> fair yeah. work and all the legislation the compliance that goes with it so just hesitate to add those of you who are listening out there are going yeah yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna get someone on board just make sure you know what it is that's uh, that's required and have a chat to your uh, bookkeeper um, in particular and your accountant um, about what what that involves and have a decent lead in time don't just mm-hmm. rock up to your mm-hmm. accountant and go I employed someone Great. When did that happen? Two months ago. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I see that all the time. So I guess that, that planning and preparation mm. is really important, but not just from a compliance point of view or understanding financially, but as you said at the beginning of the program, Ingrid, that, you know, really understanding what your reasoning is so yeah, you can yeah. give that to someone yeah. and bring someone along. Yeah. But just it, it helps, doesn't it? Yeah. For your own journey, it helps to, I guess, um, understand what, where you're heading. It's a good point at Absolutely. which to sit down and work that out. Absolutely. And it, I think it's about being really clear around what are you trying to achieve here? Mm. Are, you, have, are you happy with just having created a job for yourself? That might be perfect. Um, or do you just want to work with a team of associates? That's fine. Um, or are you actually in the business of wanting to build a business? Mm. Um, and those real moments of looking in the mirror... And being really honest with oneself um, and being clear around what that will take in order to do it right. Yeah. I mean, it's all those things that you've just got to wrap that up in a nice bow and have that really Mm. well understood Mm. by yourself. Mm. Now, Jake, talking about strengths of small businesses, one of the things that we do much better than, you know, the corporates, particularly the multinationals who are just this big beast lumbering around, you know, with all these people hanging off their legs and not really moving. We've got flexibility. We've got, you know, the ability to move fast, but we also niche in ways that Mm. large businesses, I mean, you're not going to find, you know, or maybe you are, but, you know, there's not going to be a multinational butcher. (laughs) <laughs> and it's not going to be a multinational, I wouldn't think so, plumber, there might be. But, you know, there's not going to be those big businesses out there. That's that's one of our strengths. So um, is, that, is that a positive, being able to niche when you're um, trying to attract candidates? It can certainly be a positive. Um, there might be people who are very passionate for that industry. Um, key thing that businesses, employers need to understand is that when they're trying to recruit, they should be in sell mode. Some still have the attitude that the candidate should be selling themselves to the to them as a business. Um, the more you're in a niche, the more you need to be in sell mode. Oh. The more uh, well, your options of who the potential candidates are are far more limited. And so you might need to be proactively getting hold of candidates. And there are lots of ways to do that these days. Um, many people would use Facebook or LinkedIn. Um, also, there's an enormous database at Seek that's very successful these days. I understand does more placements, more hires than, than LinkedIn does. Mm. Um, but so if you as a business really know what you want and it's a very niche area, say like being in a butcher, being in a deli, Um, you need to be reaching out to that candidate. But from the candidate's perspective, they're probably happy where they are. So you need to have a pretty compelling story of when you approach them, why they should be talking to you, what your actual offering is. And many don't really have that. They still come to that conversation saying, hey, I've got a job, but now you sell yourself to me. And the candidate's thinking, I'm happy in my role. Why bother? Um, and they really need to kind of change the way they, hold, they approach that interaction. We're going to take a quick break here at Triple H 100.1 FM. You are listening to Small Biz Matters with Alexi Boyd. When we come back after the break, we're going to talk to Jacob, Jacob, (laughs) Jake and Ingrid about where to look. Where are those, you know, where is the perfect candidate hiding? Where do you find them? How do you evolve that side of your business? You're listening to Triple H 100.1 FM. We'll be back after this. So today we're talking all about accessing, hiring, I guess, exposing yourself. No, that, that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not that. Maybe not exposing yourself. <laughs> we're, we're talking about attracting the perfect candidate to be your business because the reality is we have to compete for those excellent candidates with 
the big boys. Um, and we talked a little earlier in the show about what are our strengths. Now, Jake, you've got a, a lot of experience in this industry in terms of the, the advertising space for, for jobs, but things have changed. Things have evolved. It's not just a matter of, you know, paying your X amount of dollars and putting it up on, on Seek. Um, there's LinkedIn now that does a lot of recruiting and Facebook. Is, is Facebook in the recruiting side of things or is it just more as another place to advertise? Uh, Facebook can be recruiting. Um, if you are sort of a medium-sized brand and you have a lot that's going out of interest to customers or to your industry. So you could use Facebook in the sense of building a following. It could be of customers, could be suppliers, could even be competitors, people who are just interested in that space. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're putting out meaningful uh, content in that space, you're going to have people who start to follow you. Mm. And so when occasionally you have something that's your own self-interest that you're trying to recruit for, for example, you can put that out through that channel. Um, that's not something, though, that you can just go and do when you recruit. That's <laughs> got to be an ongoing sort of asset, uh, really a network that, you, that you're building. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, what you're trying to do, though, beyond job ads, say, or using LinkedIn, um, is to build a pipeline of candidates. And so big corporates think of pipelining in the sense of who's going to fill a potential role and they sort of map where they could recruit from internally. But smaller businesses need to think about talent pipelining outside of their business. So where are they likely to recruit people from when they need to recruit? So you need to start sort of planting those seeds long in advance. It could be years in advance and start forming the right relationships, being perceived as a successful place, being perceived as one that delivers amazing customer experience or has got high professional standards, whatever it might be. So that when you are recruiting, there's a whole... Um, audience out there that you've already established and it might not be one of them who wants to recruit or wants to help you recruit but they might know somebody else but there'll be people who are bought into your story who are passionate about what you're trying to do however small that might be and but they will then be motivated to help you go and find that relevant candidate and they will then give you a candidate referral and they will say, oh, how about getting hold of somebody I know? Or they'll contact some friend or relative of theirs. And they'll understand who you are, what you're trying to achieve, what your culture is like, your team, your customer experience. And they will recommend relevant people to you. And that's much better than getting someone who you've never engaged with before. They don't really know much about you. And you've got to start figuring all that out. And so it's genuine. Build, build it's totally real, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I love that. It's a really great point because so many times we sit there and we go, oh, social media advertising, oh, how am I going to, you know, sell myself, sell my, build my brand and all these things. And you're thinking of it in terms of sales. But at the back of our minds, even if it's 10 years down the track, you need to think of it in terms of growth. And that's such a good mm -hmm. point. Building your brand is also building the perception out there to to source the ideal. There's def thing. definitely a relationship, sorry, between a customer brand and an employer brand. People often want to work for companies where they can relate to that company's product or experience as a consumer. And so seeing those two as interrelated is an interesting space. Often in companies, in, in bigger groups, um, people who are thinking about the employer brand will certainly involve marketing and involve customers and you should and so in a smaller business in a similar way you should be thinking about the, your brand in front of customers in a similar way as you think of your brand as an employer. Mm. That's what you were going towards at the beginning of the program there Ingrid with, with um, understanding yeah, why, why you're doing this so that mm. you can mm. articulate that mm. as well. Mm. But I think with small businesses they've also got an, another advantage they're typically working in a very specific space um, and so I think to to tap into those relationships. So let's say you've got you're a small manufacturing concern, maybe you building something customized, maybe let's say customized furniture. Um, tap into your suppliers of your timber and ask them. Um, do you happen to know anybody who might be working in a similar business who might be scouting out for a role? It's very real. It's it's basically there's. There's no real substitute for word of mouth personal referrals mm -hmm. and you just never know where those might come from. So really chat to other um, sort of 
people in your broader community, in your ecosystem, and just spread the word like that? Because they, in, in that case, they they're likely to be highly aligned mm-hmm. with actually what your business is doing. So it, it's already much easier. Um, to sell the business to them because they're in that space. Who would have thought we'd be wearing executive recruitment hats as well? <laughs> <laughs> Haven't heard and, of that one. Another thing that employers can do or should do and I often see go wrong is um, in the small space particularly, they have a wish list of what they're wanting from a candidate. You even see this in job ads. They can have 20 criteria of things that they're after. And it's great in some way that they've sort of thought about it, but in a way they also haven't really thought about it enough. I'd really encourage those small business owners is to think through what are the critical things that they need to have for, of that candidate. What are the skills or knowledge or experience or assets that that candidate brings? So try and keep it down to say maybe three things mm. and maybe all those other things are just nice to have. Mm-hmm. Don't put those in the job ad. Um, they don't really matter. They end up just putting off someone who might be potentially relevant mm. but doesn't meet criteria number 19. It also shows how you can be quite narrow-minded yourself because you're showing, you're saying, oh, you can have all these fantastic boxes ticked, but if you don't know how to use this particular type of software, Mm. I can't Mm. be bothered to teach you Mm. or put Mm. you on a course Mm -hmm. where you're going to learn something as simple as that. Therefore, you're not the ideal candidate. Bad. Mm. That just looks Mm. terrible out there. For, For most roles, I think employers can focus more on the skills or capabilities that the candidate has got and then focus on things like motivation which align with the purpose stuff that we discussed Mm -hmm. earlier, Um, much more than the knowledge they've got. Particularly young people these days, they're so resourceful. They learn things very fast. They know how to get knowledge. They know how to get content. So focus on the underlying skill or capability that they need to bring and give them that content, give them the actual facts which they need to have about your particular industry. Mm -hmm. And that would work if you're in some sort of niche and could recruit from sort of an associated niche where you've got someone who thinks a certain way, they behave a certain way, they treat customers a certain way, for example, or they think passionately about marketing or sales or whatever it might be and then you just give them the knowledge and so maybe the knowledge is often a lower priority than the skill or the capability mm. and, and often focus mm. on that it's more. a good way to prioritize that as mm. well would you agree ingrid absolutely and i think um in terms of accepting that uh you are highly likely to have to provide training of some sort or another it's highly unlikely that you're going to have someone arrive who can get going immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, part of what will enable a small business owner to get over that hurdle is to actually just map through the whole process. So to think ahead, think, okay, what's going to happen on day one? What what are we going to do in the first week? Um, what will we need to do in the first month and the first three months? And to, to really be clear around what exactly it is that the new team member will be required to do and what are the things that they'll be learning along the way and how are you actually going to train them? Because clearly in a small team, that place is significant. Mm. Um, it's, it's a challenge in a small business to find time both to, you know, keep the business going as well as train up a new candidate. But once you actually break it down and you plan it and you map it through, it's maybe not so daunting and you can get your head around the fact that, ah, oh, yeah, in fact, things that I thought were essential, they're no longer essential. It's mm. pretty easy to train someone up on those. I just need to have planned it. And that's going to be key in the actual interview process as well because a candidate's highly likely to ask questions that point to that onboarding process and if one hasn't actually thought that through it's not going to come across well because typically that's the kind of stuff that the bigger businesses have got waxed and that's and that's a really good way to wrap today's program we've we've talked about you know even just the the lead in to employing or the lead into finding that perfect candidate all the way through to the interview process the the searching process the, the advertising process and then thinking ahead thinking about that first up to three months, what is it that you're going to do? Because the perfect candidate is going to ask those questions. It's a really good point, Ingrid. Mm-hmm. And you want them to stay. And sometimes it's as simple as, have you taken time to just catch up for a coffee? Mm. You know, 
at, exactly at least that. once a week to see how they're tracking. Was that the critical thing that yes. you could have done to before they actually tendered their resignation? That's right. Yeah. Keep keeping that quality candidate is absolutely critical. People yeah. really have to think about that. What are you going to do to retain? If you retain well, then maybe you have to spend less time on training and the whole attraction interview process. In the process. first place, that's yeah. right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the program today. Now, Ingrid, where can people find out more about your business and how to get hold of you? Uh, please go to our website, which is bambooassociates.com.au and all our details are there and contact numbers and don't hesitate to give us a call or drop us a line, whatever works best for you. Well, thank you so much, Jake and Ingrid, for coming on today's program with Small Biz Matters with Alexi Boyd. If you've missed any of today's program, you can, of course, catch up on Podbean, on iTunes, on our website, Small Biz Matters com.au or wherever you get your podcasts. Please subscribe to our iTunes and if you're enjoying these uh, podcasts, please give us a little like and maybe a little comment. That'd be great. And uh, thank you so much for being our listeners and for helping drive the show and drive the sort of questions that you want answered. We are the experts in small business education. You're listening to Small Biz Matters on Triple H 100.1 FM. We'll see you all next week.